All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Zechariah chapter 11? And as you're doing that, I would like you to think about this. Have you ever set out to do something and received counsel from an authoritative source related to that? And you've said to yourself, you know, I think I know a better way to do this. Maybe you're starting a business or you're doing something big and you have good, trusted counsel to help you do that. But you've used your own thought process and you've used your own analysis and you think you have a better way to do this because you honestly believe that your plan will serve you better. And even though there are parts of your plan that go against the counsel that's been given to you, you've got tons of confidence in your own plan because genuinely you truly believe that your plan will serve you better. Well, sometimes your plans actually do work out, but when it doesn't, don't you ever feel the weight of rejecting that counsel? Today, we're gonna to be looking at the cost of rejecting God's provision for human shepherding. God has one and only one plan for human shepherding, and the centerpiece of that plan is none other than Christ himself. And today, we're gonna to be looking at two groups of people who actually did reject God's provision for shepherding. Both of them asserted themselves as shepherds. They considered themselves to be shepherds, and so they asserted themselves in front of the people, and both suffered severe, dire consequences, permanent consequences, because of that rejection. And first, we're going to look at the cost of rejection to the false shepherds, and we're going to see that over the course of the first 14 verses of this chapter. And the first area where it costs these false shepherds is in their security, their fallen security. So we're going to look at that in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 11. As I read the first couple of verses of this chapter, it's helpful to have a picture in your mind of a map that contains the northern region of Israel, the border of Israel, and what's beyond that to the north, and then to the east as well. Let me read verses 1 and 2. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that a fire may consume your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen, because the mighty trees have been destroyed. Wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the impenetrable forest has come down. I want to start by noticing the geographical indicators that there are here in this passage. We see Lebanon. Again, that's the region that's north of Israel. It borders it on the north side of the Promised Land. And we see there's a mention of doors here, and we know what doors are. They're usually a, a guard or a means of protection. But our passage here tells us, open your doors. In other words, God is speaking and he is saying, your border on the north will be compromised and invaders will enter. And there's mention of cedars. And we know these cedar trees. These are magnificent trees. They're very large, beautiful trees. And they're a source of pride for the people of Lebanon and the people in the northern region of Israel as well. They're very significant to the local economy. And we touched on that a couple of weeks ago. But the message here is that fire is going to consume those cedars and it's going to devastate the landscape, and it's going to devastate the, the pride of the people and the economy of the region. An invading army will burn those forests. And there's mention of cedar and cypress, and it's interesting for us to notice that both of these woods were used in the construction of Solomon's temple. The way to understand why they're both important is because the, the cedar was used for everything that was above the ground in the temple. Everything that was made out of wood that was above the ground was made of cedar. They had framework and they had paneling. They had an overlay on the altar. All of those things were made of cedar. But the floorboards themselves were made of cypress. And when you read, Wail, O Cypress, for the cedar has fallen, literally what, what God is saying is the framework of the temple, the paneling, the altar, everything on it is going to come crashing to the ground. And so what Israel needs to understand here in this message is that in the same way that Nebuchadnezzar came along and destroyed Solomon's temple, another nation is coming to destroy the temple that's in the future. And what this is, is a picture of Rome. This is a picture of Rome and their destruction of Herod's temple in Jerusalem in, in AD 70. And so Zechariah then moves from Lebanon in the north. He kind of moves a little bit to the south, southeast, and he speaks of the region of Bashan, which is kind of in the northeast of region of the promised land and the invasion is moving in that direction 
And he says, Wail, O oaks of Bashan. And again, these, these oaks are, are magnificent trees. They're brilliant trees. They're beautiful trees. And they're used in the commerce in the promised land. They were also used for construction of idols and idol worship. And in addition to that, they performed and provided a, a natural border of protection for Israel. This, uh, this forest of oak trees was very dense and very thick. And it was not safe to be in there. In fact, that's where Absalom was when, when he and David were at odds and Absalom was seeking to gain superiority over David in, in 2 Samuel 28. There was a battle that took place in the forest of Ephraim, and that is the Oaks of Bashan. I just want to read to you from 2 Samuel, uh, and I'm going to read verse 8, and we're going to see here what, what actually described what, what took place in the forest here. The battle there was scattered over the whole countryside, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. This was a dangerous place. You didn't just go for a walk in this forest. It was full of obstacles, pitfalls, and danger. And so the people of Bashan looked at that forest, and they looked at it and said, that is our natural source of protection from anybody who would seek to, to come into us. But the word we see there is that the impenetrable forest has come down. And so what this is saying is that an advancing army would destroy the forest. And they would come in and they would affect Israel's commerce and all these trees would be wailing. You see the, the oak trees are wailing, the cypress, the cedars are wailing. So there's gonna be a growing dismay in Israel. But what happens in verse three is, is Zechariah moves his attention away from the land to the people themselves. And he says, there is the sound of the shepherd's wail for their might is destroyed. There is the sound of the young lion's roar for the pride of Jordan is removed. So the advancing army not only is going to affect the landscape and, and the forest and the trees, but it's going to affect these shepherds themselves. It's going to affect them in the way that it's going to remove their might. And it's going to remove the influence that these shepherds have over all of the people. And so these men who prided themselves on their influence and on their power, they're going to wail as those very things are taken away from them. And so the summary here is that Zechariah is speaking of a time in the future when an advancing army will, will take away the influence and the authority and the power of the false shepherds. And it will be so devastating that they will wail over the loss of it. When we think back to chapter 10, we think about the way that chapter ends. It's a beautiful picture of the millennial kingdom. And it's a picture of how God is going to be at work in the people who inhabit that time and that space. God will make them mighty. They will walk in his name. These are wonderful, wonderful promises that are there. And so when you think about that, and then you read the first three verses of this chapter, you ask yourself, well, what could bring about such a stern judgment from God? And the answer is the false shepherds and the rejection of Messiah. And there's no other explanation for it. So God is going to bring about their destruction. But the consequence of this, of the wicked leadership, is going to bleed into the common people itself. And God has plans for their destruction as well. And you see that in verses 4 through 6. And you see that uh, that is what is the case for the doomed flock. So let's look at verses 4 through 6 together. And as we do that, it's very helpful for us to understand what's taking place in verses 4 through 14. Zechariah is acting out a role play. He is acting out this play in front of his people there in this time frame, 480 BC. And in the outperforming of this play, in the outacting of this play, what happens is Zechariah is actually communicating God's judgment to Israel. So that as he acts out this play, it's communicating to the people that God is going to judge Israel. And it's important for us to understand the time frame that's in view here as well. And what's in view here is a period of time after the crucifixion of Jesus, and it's before Rome destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. So it's a period of about 40 years, and the focus is on that period of time. And keep that in mind as we read these three verses, 4, 5, and 6. Thus says Yahweh my God, shepherd the flock doomed to slaughter, those who buy them slaughter them and are not held guilty. And each of those who sell them says, Blessed be Yahweh, indeed I have become rich. And their own shepherds do not spare them, for I will no longer spare the inhabitants of the land, declares Yahweh. 
But behold, I will cause the men to fall, each into another's hand, into the hand of his king, and they will crush the land, and I will not deliver them from their hand. This is some of the most sobering verses that are written in the entire book. The commissioning that God gives to Zechariah there is in the beginning of the verse, shepherd the flock. And we know what shepherding is. Godly shepherding is a picture of the true shepherd, Jesus Christ himself, and how he truly cares for Israel in his earthly ministry. That is what Zechariah is to do in front of all of the people. He is to act out what it looks like to shepherd so that people will understand exactly who the true Messiah, who the true shepherd really is. But he's to act it out in front of a people who later will become doomed to slaughter, and that flock is doomed to slaughter. The common people of Israel would be slaughtered in this time frame that we're looking at here at the very end of it. Josephus estimated that there were more than a million people who lost their lives, a million Jews who suffered the loss of their life as Rome came through Israel through Judea, and took Jerusalem. But the focus here is what happened in Judah prior to that time, prior to AD 70 and and the burning of the temple. And we're going to see that as we make our way through the passage. We read that those who buy them slaughter them. So common Jews here are being sold as slaves. They're being sold from their own country as slaves to foreign peoples. And the implication here is that they're being sold by their own people. They're being sold by their own religious leadership. We see that with the phrase, each of those who sell them. That helps us understand that this is a widespread practice among religious elites, among the religious leaders in Israel, was to sell your own people into slavery. And this next phrase helps us understand exactly how blind these people really are. It's really good for us to get our minds around this. They are so blind that say, they say, blessed be Yahweh. Indeed, I have become rich. They've become rich by the sale of these people. No Gentile would say, blessed be Yahweh. So these have to be the the Jews who are speaking this. They have to be the Jews who have some kind of position, and some kind of authority to do this. But they are so corrupt and so deceived that they see the profit that they gain from the sale of their their own people as an occasion to praise the Lord. That is a truly distorted, truly disturbed leadership that's spiritual. But their own shepherds don't spare them. Rather than pointing these people, these dear common people, to the Savior, the only one that can save them and help them and guide them, they sell them into slavery. They're participating in the very thing that God condemns. But God says, I will no longer spare the inhabitants of the land. So the false shepherds, they did not spare their people And God is clear that his judgment is from him. He is the one who is not going to spare them. Then God says, I will cause men to fall into each other's hand. The men, the common people, are going to fall into their own hands, and we'll get into this in just a couple of minutes. But we'll see that one of the means that God is using to destroy his own people are the people themselves. But then he also says, and into the hand of his king. So the Jews are going to bring harm to one another in this time frame, but the bigger picture is that the Jews had no king of their own, and their king, as they said, was Caesar. If we turn in our Bibles to John chapter 19, we can see this. Zechariah is preaching about a time, and he's foretelling a time in which Judah is going to say, we don't have a king here, but we do have a king, and that king is Caesar. Pilate is before his people, and it's the time of the crucifixion, and he has Jesus, and everything has really been done by this time, and Pilate says to them, In verse 15 of John 19, shall I crucify your king? And look who answers. It's the chief priests who answer. And they say, we have no king but Caesar. So this helps us understand that the Jews and the Jewish leadership has begun this process of selling out to the Romans. And that's been in effect for many decades prior to this time. But the key thing here is that they're aligning themselves and they're giving their allegiance to Rome. And what God says here is, I will crush the land and I will not deliver them from their hand. And so God has an irony here, and that is that the Jews are going to be giving their allegiance to Rome by saying, we have no king but Caesar, but it's that very one that God is going to use to destroy them himself. So the role play helps Judah know that one day their own people will be destroyed. So again, Zechariah is acting this out in front of his own people. 
But the role play continues in the next section, and we see the reason for Judah's destruction is because they've actually rejected the shepherd himself. So we talk about the rejected shepherd in verses 7 through 12 of chapter 11. And here, Zechariah is explaining the ministry of the true shepherd and the benefit that he brings to the people of Judah. But what happens here is that this is overshadowed by Judah's treatment of Jesus. So Zechariah is obedient, and in verse 7 he says, I shepherded the flock doomed to slaughter, hence the afflicted of the flock. And I took for myself two staffs, and the one I called favor, and the other I called union. So, or thus, I shepherded the flock. So when Jesus shepherded the flock, he did what a shepherd does. He provided care, nurturing care, to care for and feed the people. And many of these people were afflicted. They were the poor, they were the lowly, they were the outcast, they were the forgotten ones, they were the ones who had, had no means on their own. And so what, what Shepherd does here is that Jesus is giving us a picture, and Zechariah is showing us exactly what it is that Jesus would do. So he's shepherding the people. And he starts off by just shepherding them. But we see where this goes. He has a staff called favor. And the thing we need to understand about this staff called favor is that this represents God's relationship with man, man's relationship with God. And so that what's in view here is God's grace, his loving care over the people. And that's exactly what was characteristic of Jesus' ministry. Jesus was pointing his people that he was ministering to, to reconciliation with God through God's grace, repentance and faith in him, only through faith in his atoning sacrifice. So the staff called favor helps the people understand that, that God has favor on his people, but it's through his grace, through the person of Jesus Christ in their place. The staff that's called union represents man's relationship with man, gathering of believers together into one body. So favor over here talks about man's relationship with God, and union over here is talking primarily about man's relationship with man. And so Zechariah says, I shepherded the flock. And that's what Christ came to do in his earthly ministry, was extend God's grace to man and gather believers together in one unit. It's a Jew and the Gentile together in one. But we see things change in verse 8. Zechariah writes, Then I annihilated the three shepherds in one month, for my soul was impatient with them, and their soul was weary of me. He speaks of three shepherds, and the passage doesn't identify who these three shepherds are, but we know they're, they're people who are in positions of authority. So it's reasonable religious authority. It's reasonable to conclude that these three positions are something like the priests and the scribes and the elders, all of those who are just absolutely derelict in their responsibilities before God. So what we see here is, I annihilated the three shepherds. This means to remove without any kind of trace whatsoever. So, and it is in fact the fact that the offices of priest and scribe and elder were gone permanently at the time that Rome took Jerusalem. And it took place in one month. We see the reference to one month there as well. Jerusalem would once again be taken in one month. And that again was confirmed when Rome came and, and besieged the city. And most of the activity was accomplished, and they destroyed the city mostly in one month. But we see the relationship and the interaction between, between the sheep and the shepherd here. The shepherd says, my soul was impatient with them. Jesus gave these people every opportunity. He gave the shepherds every opportunity to fulfill their role, and they were never faithful in that role. They always disobeyed. They always misused and mistreated their role for their own personal gain. And Jesus' patience with them had expired. But he wasn't the only one who was disappointed in this relationship. They were disappointed with him. Their soul was weary of him. Jesus' ministry was characterized by calling them out and pointing out how poor they were in the task of actually leading the people, the thing that they asserted themselves as being worthy of doing. And they were weary of hearing Jesus consistently calling them out and speaking of the way in which they were ineffective in the task that they were doing. They had no interest in following Christ or representing Christ or leading people to Christ. Their only interest really was in themselves. So they're very weary of Christ. In verse 9, he says, I will not shepherd you. What is to die, let it die. 
what is to be annihilated, let it be annihilated, and let those who remain consume one another's flesh. Jesus says, I will not shepherd you. He saw the hardness of heart of all of the leaders and the people, and he would just remove his care for them. This is what he did after he saw their hardness of heart. It's interesting for us to notice that at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, when he came to the earth, he was performing miracles and he was doing much public teaching. There was much explanation, but the heart of the hearts, the people's heart was hard. And, but at the beginning, he was characterized by full explanation. And towards the end of his ministry, after he saw the hardness of heart of all of these people, he spoke in parables to the people. He only spoke plainly to the disciples and those who would believe in him. So what we have here is a hardness of these people and their hardened hearts toward Christ. And so the result is, what is to die, let it die. Christ would let the hardness of heart run its course in these people. They would receive the just penalty for their sin. And he speaks here again of those who remain will consume one another's flesh. And this is one of the most sobering things in Israel's history. They've been oppressed by many other people throughout their history. But here it helps us understand just how bad things were that Israel would turn against themselves. Food was so scarce during the Roman uh, conquest and taking of Jerusalem in AD 70 that the people did unspeakable things to, take, to stay alive. They would eat one another. And this is part of God's judgment on Judah, is Judah actually destroying itself. So in verse 10, you see the result of this. And it has to do with what is done to the staff favor. I took my staff favor and I cut it in pieces to break my covenant, which I had cut with all the peoples. God is telling Judah something very important here. He's saying a future time is coming when I will no longer extend my hand of favor towards Judah. What God had done here is he had established a covenant with others, not a formal covenant with other nations, but informally he had done something. We're not saying here that God is going to remove his covenant with Israel. That's not at all what's in view here because the the book is all about God remembering his covenant with Israel and he's faithful to keep his promise. What is in view here is that God has covenanted with neighboring lands and he has covenanted with them in such a way that he will cause them and restrain them from the activities that they want to do and aggression against Israel. And God is saying, I'm going to break that. I'm going to release my restraining hand upon them and allow them to do as they please with Israel. So the covenant which I had, I cut with all the peoples. God had restrained the nations around Israel for the purpose of protecting Israel. And God is saying that is going to be over. Israel had been unfaithful for generations, but they had always existed as a nation since the time of Abraham. But here God is saying, I'm going to break that covenant with the peoples. They're going to do as they please. And that came to pass 40 years after those false shepherds crucified Jesus. It actually did come to pass. Rome destroyed Jerusalem. Israel ceased to exist as a people for very nearly 1,900 years until 1948. So we see that in verse 11. So it was broken on that day. And thus the afflicted of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of Yahweh. It was broken on that day. God is saying, at one point in time, I will come to the place where I will break that covenant and they will be released on the people. And that is what took place. The afflicted of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of Yahweh. Those who believed the message of Jesus during the time of his earthly ministry, they were watching Jesus carry out his earthly ministry and they knew that Jesus' teaching was from the Lord. They heard and they believed Jesus' own words when he said, my teaching is not mine, but it's his who sent me. And so the role play continues in verse 12 as we end this section. And I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages. But if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Zechariah is foretelling something here. And what he's foretelling is how little Judah would value their savior. If it is good in your sight, give me my wages. What we're seeing here is that Messiah Jesus is going to be saying to Judah, you, Judah, you make an assessment of me and what is due to me as your savior. He's not talking about a a cash reimbursement. What he's talking about here is honor. Honor is due to him because he is the true shepherd. 
There is only one right response to the true shepherd, and that is to honor him. If you believe it's fitting to honor me, then give me the honor that is due to me. He says, if not, never mind. What he's saying here is something that's really, really sobering. When we say never mind, that usually means no big deal. What Jesus is saying here is, if you don't believe that I am worthy of your honor, if you don't believe that I am the true shepherd, and because of that you will honor me, then you need to cease and desist. You will cease and you will desist. Jesus doesn't demand their honor. Notice this. He's different from false shepherds. He doesn't demand their honor, but he just tells them that if you do not honor me, it will not go well for you in the end. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver. And what this does is this describes the false shepherd's true assessment of Christ. And we see that in in Matthew 26, verse 15. When Judas says, what, will you, what are you willing to give me to deliver him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. 30 pieces of silver here was, was mentioned by Zechariah. It's brought to pass in our New Testaments. What this helps us understand here is not a focus on a particular amount of money, but rather what that money represents. What these 30 pieces of silver represent in the Old Testament was the going rate to compensate the owner of a slave when that slave was gored by an ox that was owned by somebody else. The bottom line here is that to the chief priests, Jesus was no more significant than a slave. So that's helpful for us to understand. And what we see here is that there is a coming judgment that is coming on these people. And this is where the the role play meets its final scene. And we see that starting in verse 13. And we're going to see verse 13 in two pieces. It's going to be helpful for us. Yahweh says to me, throw it to the potter, that valuable price at which I was valued by them. We notice the term throw there. Whenever you're talking about throwing money, you know what's in view there is disdain, disrespect, those kinds of things. That's what these people had for Jesus. They had nothing more than disdain and disrespect for him. We think about a potter. That's somebody whose products were purchased for a very small sum of money. So to say, throw money to the potter is like saying, throw money to things that that don't really matter. And that valuable price is is sarcasm on God's part. The Jews are are making so little of Jesus. It was a message and an indication of Judah's devaluation of Christ that could not be more obvious than that. But we see in the second half of verse 13 that here is where Israel's judgment comes into view. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of Yahweh. Now, we just mentioned that a potter is is a very common, it's a very lowly occupation in New Testament Israel and Old Testament Israel, but it was also a sign of authority. I want us to turn in our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 18. We're going to look at verse 6. We're going to see that when you hear messages and you hear words about a potter, you need to be thinking about authority. God says, can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares Yahweh. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. God is telling Judah something very, very clearly in this role playing. He is saying, I am in a position to do with you as I please. You are to me as clay in the hand of the potter, and I will judge you for your pitiful, small, meager valuation of my son. So that's what God said he would do, and Zechariah actually acts that out in verse 14, as we see this. So then I cut in pieces my second staff union to break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Back in verse 10, we see that favor was broken, symbolizing what God would do to remove his favor from Israel. Here, God is breaking union. And God is telling Israel, I have told you that I will reunite you in the past. And we've seen that in previous chapters, that God has promised to bring together the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You see all kinds of mentions of Ephraim and the northern kingdom and Joseph all throughout the first 10 chapters. And the idea that you get is that God is going to be unifying the tribes together again. 
There is a unification that's needed because the kingdom was divided under Jeroboam and Rehoboam right after Solomon's reign. And God has said, I will do that. But what God is saying here when he breaks the staff union is he is saying, that day is coming, but it's not coming for a long time. It is not coming for a long time. And for a long time, you will have to endure the situation in which you are still divided as a nation. Again, union is talking about man's relationship with man and God is telling them, you know, you are not gonna have a right relationship with the Northern Kingdom for a very long time. And all of it has to do with your rejection of Messiah Jesus. So the summary in all of this, the invasion of the Romans, the judgment of the Jews is coming about and it's coming about for one and only one reason. And that is because Israel rejected their Messiah It's a clear message of God's judgment on them because of how small and how little honor and praise they gave to Christ himself. God gave Israel counsel, very clear counsel throughout his Old Testament. Your Messiah is coming. Your Savior is coming. He is humble. He's mounted on a donkey. He is coming to save you. You should prize him. You should cherish him. But Israel thought they knew better. They had a better plan a plan that would serve their interests better. And they felt, would, uh, they felt that would serve them better, but they are going to start feeling the weight of their rejection. So that's the story in the first part of our chapter here. We need to understand this very clearly. God is saying there is a cost. There is a final weight when you reject your Messiah. But there's an application for us here. And the application for us is, what is your relationship to the true shepherd? In other words, for the believer, is Christ undoubtedly your shepherd? Believer, do you have an increasing submission to his lordship in your life? Does his lordship in your life affect you in more and more and more areas of your life? Think about all the different pieces of your life that God has given you. He's given you your family relationships. He's given you a job. He's given you other things. He's given you finances. He's given you friendships. Is it evident that Christ's lordship is playing an increasing role, is having increasing authority over you in all of those different areas of your life. If it is, praise God. Praise God for that. But it's good for us to measure ourselves. How much do we prize? How much do we honor Christ? The easiest way for us to see that is just look at all the different pieces of your life and how much does his lordship over your life affect you in those areas. Unbeliever, if you're not following Christ, There is a message here for you, and that message is, have you weighed the consequence of your refusal to recognize that Christ actually is worthy of your honor? He is the one and only shepherd. You can expect an outcome that is no different than the outcome that was in place for all of these false shepherds and the common people as well. Consider carefully the cost of rejection of Christ, the true shepherd. Then the attention switches to the the last part of the chapter, three verses, and the focus here is on the worthless shepherd. There is a cross of rejection to the worthless shepherd himself. Now, in the Old Testament, Israel had a, a long history of false shepherds. During the time of Elijah, there were 450 prophets of Baal, and Elijah stood against them. During Ezekiel's time, Ezekiel prophesied and he taught that false prophets have misled the people of Israel. You can see the same thing taking place in Jeremiah as well and other places throughout your Old Testament. Israel had a long history of false prophets. False prophets are, and false shepherds are part of Satan's plan to disrupt God's kingdom purposes for Israel. That was what he was attempting to do all along. It continued throughout the Old Testament. It continued in the intertestamental period. And then it continued on in Jesus' earthly ministry through the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What those groups of people did was they piled on their own laws on top of God's perfect and good laws. And they levied those laws on people. They were weighty, heavy laws. And they obscured the truth of God's perfect law, which revealed God's character. They were a tool in Satan's hand to draw people away from the truth of who God is. That same thing has continued in the church age today. You have the Roman Catholic Church that has hidden the scriptures from its people. I had a conversation with somebody today, uh, this week. They had uh, they'd been attending Christ a church for 50 years, and they did not know 
from Scripture how it is that they could be saved. We have the Mormon belief system. They haven't necessarily hidden the Scriptures, but they have hidden Christ himself and obscured Christ for who he is. So throughout human history, Satan has instruments and he has tools that he is using. False shepherds are among them. But his biggest, his most powerful, and his most capable instrument is yet to come. And that's the subject of the last three verses, the worthless shepherd. So we ask ourselves, why would God allow this? Why would God allow such a deception to pervade the whole world? And the truth is, dealing with the person of the Antichrist. He's going to come into play in the seven years that, that come to be after the rapture of the church. He's coming into play after the rapture of the church for the specific purpose so that God can fulfill his promises to Israel during that time of Jacob's trouble. It's very important for us to understand that, that this worthless shepherd is part of God's plan to fulfill his promises to Israel. So we see Satan's threats to the messianic line, and we see this all over scriptures. We see it in Genesis chapter 3. We see it in the fall. Satan has, has drawn Adam and Eve and enticed them into sin. So now the whole world is beset with sin. In Exodus 1, you have Pharaoh. And what he's doing is he's killing all of the young Jewish boys. That is a threat to the messianic line. Exodus 14, Pharaoh again has arrayed his whole army against Israel. Again, that is a threat to the messianic line. You get to our New Testament, and we see in Matthew chapter 2 that Herod issued a decree to kill all the Jewish boys two years old and younger, another threat to the messianic line. Matthew 4, Satan tempts Jesus. He's trying to lure him into sin to disqualify him from going to the cross as an innocent substitute. That's another threat. In the Gospels, all four of the Gospels have the story of Judas' betrayal of Jesus. Satan is working really, really, really hard to destroy the messianic line because if what he wanted was there to be no cross, no savior on a cross dying in place of all of those who would put their trust in him. None of these have been deceptive. None of them have been successful at all. But it doesn't stop Satan from trying. And that's what we need to understand here. He's saving his very best effort for last. So we have to ask ourselves, who is the Antichrist? Who is this person who's being represented in these three verses? He's a man, and he is possessed by Satan. He is an instrument in Satan's hand to do his work and his will. He's very persuasive. You need to understand that. You need to understand that he's very much able to control politics. He's very much able to control economy. He presents himself and he asserts himself as a religious leader. All of these things are rolled together in one person. He's exceedingly persuasive to people. But above all of this, he is a deceiver and he is a destroyer, just like Satan who is enlisting his service. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, we read this. It's speaking of the Antichrist himself. He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. The world, the many there, is going to make a covenant with Antichrist. And he will deceive the many, or the world, into making him the object of their trust, making him the object of their worship. They're going to put all of their confidence in him. And he's going to do that for one week. That's one period of seven years. It's the 70th week. It's the seven-year time of Jacob's trouble. We call it the Great Tribulation. So the first half of the tribulation is a false peace. He makes this covenant, and it's a covenant involving false peace. But he forsakes that covenant. And we see that in the second half of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. In the middle of that week, he will make sacrifice and grain offering cease. He will assert himself. So the Antichrist will break his covenant with the world, and he will proclaim himself to be God. And he will convince the many to go to war against Israel. And again here, the object of Satan, who is directing all of this, is the extermination of the people of Israel. It's because of all of these things that he will incur some judgment. So what we're going to see first as we look at this is his destructiveness. And that's taken care of in the first two verses of the chapter. Verse 15, take again for yourself the equipment of a foolish shepherd 
And again, the Antichrist is foolish. This shepherd is foolish because he is acting like God when there is only one God. And he's acting as if the one and only true God doesn't exist and that he is the one to be worshipped. That makes him foolish. But the instruction here is to take his equipment. And Zechariah doesn't say what that equipment is, but he doesn't need to say what it is because we can understand from what his objective is, is that this equipment is what will enable him to bring harm to the people of Israel. Let's read verse 16 together. Behold, I am going to raise up a shepherd in the land who will not do several things, will not care for those who face annihilation, will not seek the young, will not heal the broken or sustain the one standing, but will consume the flesh of the fat sheep and tear off their hoofs. That is his work. That's what he's going to do. But we need to make sure we understand God's sovereign hand in all of this. God is going to raise him up. There is so much violence that's going to take place here, but all of it aligns with God's plan for human history. We need to make sure we know that and understand that. The activity here is represented by four things that he will not do. He will not care for those who face annihilation. At the end times, the armies of the world will be gathered around and united against Israel. They'll be surrounding Jerusalem and Armageddon. And Antichrist is going to be leading that. He's going to be doing nothing to protect Israel during this time. And the reason why is because Satan's plan is to exterminate and annihilate Israel. So he won't care for those who face annihilation. He doesn't seek the young. We know what is characteristic of young people. Young people are helpless. They cannot fend for themselves. They can't provide for themselves. They really can't even feed themselves. They can't help themselves. Antichrist is going to do nothing for them. Nothing to protect them. Nothing to defend them. And this is perfectly in keeping with Satan's character. Did you know that when you read scripture, you never read of Satan as being a protector or being a defender or being a helper? Antichrist is emulating Satan's behavior, emulating his character in all that he does. So he won't care for those who are being annihilated. He won't care for the young. And he doesn't heal the broken. And you think about Jesus' earthly ministry. It's full of healing. And this is what is so encouraging about Jesus. His ministry was full of miraculous healing, and that healing did two things. On one hand, it validated Jesus' identity as the Son of God. When you see the, the, the miracles that Jesus would perform, there is one conclusion, and only one conclusion, is that this man is the Son of God on the basis of what he has just done to demonstrate that. It validates Jesus' Identity as the Son of God, it validates his message. There were lots of messages that were floating around, including messages by Sadducees and Pharisees. Jesus' ministry was full of miracles, and all of those miracles pointed to Christ himself and validated the message that he was speaking about himself. But he also healed and showed that he was tender and merciful and caring and kind. And that is the exact opposite of the caring or the character of the Antichrist. Because again, his objective is to exterminate Israel. So you have Jesus here. He heals the broken. The Antichrist doesn't do any of that because he is opposite in character to Christ himself. And so he doesn't help the ones who need help, but he doesn't actually sustain the ones who are more able to sustain themselves. He said he doesn't sustain the ones standing. So there's no enabling grace to help you walk through this life. Romans 6 tells us that the believer has grace to walk in newness of life because we have a new relationship to sin because Christ is on the throne of our lives. Sin has been deposed and Christ is on the throne of our lives. We can walk in newness of life. That is not what the, the Antichrist does. He does nothing to enable the believer to walk in newness of life. So those are the things that he doesn't do. He's nothing like the person of Christ. The world is lining up behind him. They see him, but they're deceived. He's nothing like Christ. The end of the verse tells us what he does do. He consumes the flesh of the fat sheep. And the description here moves away from denial and deprivation, and it moves to destruction, a violent, violent destruction. And the idea here behind consuming is not really to do with eating. It's more like the idea of a fire that consumes a forest where nothing is left. That's the underlying characteristic of the Antichrist. He wants to 
exterminate and remove Israel so that nothing is left of it. And Jesus knew the weight of this for Israel. He knew how dangerous this was for Israel. This was a big deal for them. So he tells them in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16, when you see the abomination of desolation, then those who are in Judah must flee to the mountains. Jesus is literally telling them, flee for your life because that's what the Antichrist aims to take from you. He aims to remove each and every one of you from the surface of the earth. And so it seems like the Antichrist is unstoppable, that there is no opposition to him, that there's nothing that he can do to stop him. The entire world is behind him. But it's very important for us to remember that just two chapters ago in in chapter 9, we looked at how God controlled Alexander to accomplish his purpose. God is doing the very, very same thing here. We're comforted in the knowledge that in the end will come, and we see that in verse 17. We see the destruction of Antichrist. What we can't miss here is is God's sovereign hand in everything. Woe to the worthless shepherd who forsakes the flock. A sword will be on his arm and on his right eye. His arm will be totally dried up and his right eye will be utterly dimmed. So we know what woe is. Woe is saying there is destruction coming and it is inevitable. This antichrist who has all of this authority and all of this power, his end is coming. And the reason why it's coming is because he forsakes the flock the flock that is so precious to God. We need to understand what this sword is about here. We see the sword being mentioned here. This refers to divine vengeance. Isaiah 34, verse 5, My sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon the people whom I have devoted to destruction. So God's sword is waiting to be unleashed here. And notice that it's in heaven. It's waiting. It's under God's control. It's under God's authority. It's under God's timing. It's going to accomplish God's judgment on a specific target for those who are devoted to destruction. So God's going to carry out his vengeance against the Antichrist on two body parts we see here that are listed. One is his arm and the other is his eye. The arm is a sign of your strength in battle. If you have big, strong arms, you're going to do well in battle against somebody who doesn't. And if you have an eye, you can see. You have better vision than somebody else. You can observe your situation that's in front of you much better than anybody else. Antichrist's arm is going to be dried up, meaning that all of his power, all of his authority is going to be dried up. It's sort of like a riverbed that is dried up that once had water in it. You can tell that it was there at one time, but it's no longer there. Everybody will know that Antichrist's power has been removed from him. It'll be obvious to see. His right eye is going to be dimmed His ability to see and perceive will be gone. So he'll be blinded and he'll be powerless. And the bottom line there for us is that all of his authority, all of his influence, what was granted to him ultimately by God in the first place is going to be taken from him. It will be removed and everybody will know it. It's good for us to know exactly what will be his end. When you read Revelation chapter 19, and I would encourage you to do that sometime in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be finishing our book here in the next two weeks. Go ahead and read chapter 19 of Revelation, and you will get a picture of the New Testament perspective on this very same thing that's going to be taking place. But in, in this verse, you have the, the setting here is Armageddon, and it's the battle that has not yet begun. And you have a beast here, and I'm going to read Revelation 19 verse 20. And the beast is Antichrist himself. And see what takes place here. Beast was seized, and with him the false prophet. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. So, the important thing for us to understand about Antichrist here is that he is thrown alive into the lake of fire. There's no death for him. There's no resurrection body for him. He will always bear on his body in the lake of fire as God's symbol and God's indication to him that his authority and his judgment has been removed from him and that God has authority and judgment over him. So the instruments that he used to wield his influence over the world, his arm and his eye, they will be taken from him. God's testimony to him is, I gave you authority and I gave you influence for a period of time. But in the end, I will use it to destroy you. You use that influence to destroy me and my people. I am going to destroy you. And that is the final word. 
So after deceiving the nations and exalting himself as God, controlling world economies and politics and asserting himself as the one to be worshipped, and all of those things, God is saying, when you are poised for the pinnacle of your accomplishments to annihilate Israel, I am going to describe, destroy you. So the application for us is, is very simple. It's very clear. This man is exceedingly persuasive. We just have to ask ourselves, how discerning are you with what you hear? When you hear things, either in media, when you, when you read things, you see them, things that are spoken to you, how discerning are you? Uh, the ones who will recognize Antichrist for who he is are the ones who understand the word. So read your Bibles. Read your Bibles with an open heart and an open mind, asking God to grant you the grace that you need to understand what is truth. So when falsehood is put in front of you, you can see it right away. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your goodness and your grace in revealing to us your good hand in human history. Lord, we see that there is a tremendous cost to not yielding to, not recognizing, to rejecting your son, our savior. He is the good shepherd. I pray for us as a people, Lord, as a church, you would grant us the wisdom that we need to see Christ for who he is. You would grant us the understanding, the grace that we need to embrace him or to allow his authority over us to infuse all of the areas of our lives, all of our relationships, all of our duties, all of our affections. I pray for us, Lord, that you would make us discerning in this world around us today with all that we have in front of us. In this year and all of the events that will take place in this year in this country, Lord, give us convictions from your word as to how to think rightly about all of these things. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust in your word, that your word is sure and it is true and it is unchanging. I pray for your grace to us and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.